some type of chemistry. Let's go with, uh, how about 19, maybe? That yeah, sounds good. All right, so in this chapter, uh, we uh, talked about transition metals. Uh, we also, for the good chunk of last time, uh, talked about uh, coordination numbers. Coordination, not numbers, but uh, we talked about that too. Compounds. So remember, a, a coordination compound really is uh, kind of like an ionic compound. Uh, there is a positive ion and there is a negative ion. And it's really composed of two things. It's composed of a counter ion and a complex ion. Uh, and remember that pretty much it can be either one in terms of their charge. So you can have a complex ion that is positive and thus you would have a counter ion that is negative to balance it out to zero uh, or vice versa. You could have obviously a counter ion that is uh, positive and you could have a complex ion uh, that is negative. Uh, just like an ionic compound, you know, we kind of want to use our counter ion to get ourselves to zero overall charge. Uh, we also always, both in sort of name and formula, uh, go with the positive guy first, followed by the negative guy uh, in there. Uh, remember, a complex ion is a metal that's in the middle. It's got a positive charge, which means it's really sort of electron deficient. Uh, it's attached to several, usually what are referred to as ligands, uh, which as we talked about are Lewis bases. And Lewis bases are guys that can donate a pair of electrons. Uh, so again, really good Lewis bases as we saw are, are really a lot of things that uh, perhaps have a negative charge, uh, which means that they have uh, gained some electrons. Also things that are polar that have some non-bonding electrons uh, like water or ammonia there on the central atom are also really good ones. In addition, our ligands can be, you know, several different types of ligands. We can have what are referred to as being monodentate, uh, which basically means that they bond per sort of ligand molecule, one atom uh, to the metal. Uh, we could have some that are bidentate, uh, which means that they can bind in two places per atom. So water is a good example of monodentate, ammonia. Two very common ones we come across a lot is the ethyl endyl diamine, which is oftentimes abbreviated with the EN. And again, that guy's got a couple of nitrogens uh, where in each of this EN molecule can bind twice there per a molecule. The other very common one is oxalate C2O42 minus, uh, which also through its oxygens there, its actual single bonded oxygens. Uh, through each of these oxygens here, again, in an oxalate molecule, will be able to be binding, able to be binding, yes, that too, and bind to the metal in two places. There are some that as well that are polydentate, uh, you know, combined in many different places. Uh, you know, we looked at EDTA, uh, which is like you get six sort of grabs on, onto that metal per molecule. So it grabs it in a, a lot of different places. We spent a good amount of time talking about naming these guys and um, we still do positive first followed by negative. And a big part of the naming comes as to whether or not sort of your complex ion is positive or negative. Uh, if it's positive, we just use the whole name of the metal, the regular sort of name of the metal. And if it's a negative complex ion, then the metal kind of uses the older way of naming it uh, that typically ends in eight. So again, like ferrate, cuprate, those type of guys. Uh, when we do name them though, uh, for the complex ion part, we do uh, all the ligands that are attached with their appropriate names uh, in alphabetical order, regardless of prefix. So again, if you have two or three of the same ligand, you can use a prefix like di or tri. Um, the metal always comes at the end of the complex ion name, not necessarily the end of the coordination compound name, but the end of the complex ion part of the name should always have the metal and it also should always have the Roman numeral uh, what the charge is. 
And that also goes for, as I mentioned before, typically in this type of naming, even for things that we typically don't use Roman numerals for, uh, like silver or zinc or those type of guys, uh, we will still kind of put the Roman numeral in there. And occasionally you will come across one that's actually kind of a neutral metal. Uh, so you kind of put a zero in there in place of the Roman numeral that is there. Uh, for the counter on, it's pretty much named just like uh, whatever the name of uh, it may be. If it's a polyatomic ion, you use the whole polyatomic ion. If it's just an anion or a cation, you would just use their name as well. Uh, obviously, IDE for the anion part. And regardless of how many you have. So again, if you had like two potassiums, it would still just be called potassium, whatever the rest of the name would be. Or if you had two nitrates, it would just be nitrate at the end uh, in terms of the name. We finished up, I think, talking about isomers. Uh, isomers have, uh, you know, sort of different connectivity. Uh, but they really have the same sort of formula and that different connectivity does give them some different uh, sort of properties. There's some different types of ligands, for example, like a linkage li ligand where, uh, you know, the actual same ligands involved is just the actual atom on that particular ligand. Uh, maybe in one case it was the nitrogen, I think we saw in one case it was the oxygen that was binding in. Uh, there's also cis and trans isomers. Um, which uh, cis means the same side. So what we're talking about usually in this case is those groups are sort of on the same plane, if you will, in sort of three-dimensional space. And trans would be, those groups would be on opposite sides. Um, if you have a chiral sort of molecule, when you put it up to the mirror image and you pull that guy out, uh, you cannot superimpose that mirror image on it like your hands. Uh, what we saw all with a couple of those guys is what is a slight difference in the linkage between two atoms that occurs in the mirror image. Um, and then that allows nothing to sort of line up perfectly uh, when you rotate it. Any questions on any of that stuff there we talked about last time? <clears throat> okay. Then let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of where our electrons sort of go in these transition metals, especially in these complex ions. Uh, we talked about sort of localized electron model. Uh, formation of hybrid orbitals. Uh, you remember hybrid orbitals like sp, sp2, sp3, sp3d, sp3d2. Uh, the Vesper model doesn't work really well for uh, complex ions. Uh, we look at really what's happening here in complex ions is more of a like kind of a Lewis acid base situation that's happening here where we have those electrons being no donated. Uh, the, the hybrid orbitals used by the metal depends on the number of ligands that are there. So here we have basically our six ligands that are attached uh, in this case. So this is a hybridization of sp3d2, and that is six. So if you remember, hybridization goes with electron pair geometry, right? Uh, so if you have two electron pairs, that is uh, linear, and that's usually sp. If you have three electron pairs, that's a little trigonal planar, right? A little sp2 action. Four electron pairs is tetrahedral, which is sp3. Five electron pairs, which is our expanded octet, right, is our trigonal bipyramidal which is our sp3d and our six, which is our octahedral sort of geometry, sp3d2. By the way, if you're never not sure how to do that, here's a very simple way to figure that out. You could just uh, count up electron pairs like you were doing geometry, double bonds, triple bonds count as one. So, you know, if you had three electron pairs, one, two, and three, that's an S and two P. So that is how you can get your hybridization uh, pretty quickly. So here, obviously we have six, which takes us three, four, five, and six. So an SP uh, three D two hybridization going on here. But really what's happening again is our electrons coming in from our polar nitrogen here to our deficient cobalt and donating them in. <clears throat> That gives us some geometries that we typically sort of associate uh, with uh, complex ions. Uh, that's tetrahedral, which obviously is four electron pairs, which gives us our sp3, uh, square planar. 
uh, which comes off of uh, sort of an expanded octet. And then obviously we have our linear as well. So for a coordination number, as we will see of about four, you could have two different sort of geometries, one more a tetrahedral arrangement and one more square planar arrangement for coordination number four. For coordination number two, you typically will get this more linear uh, relationship that occurs. Obviously the coordination number, as we talked about last time, is the number of atoms that are directly bound to the metal uh, in that complex ion. And typically, as we just saw there on the previous slide, if you're rolling with a coordination number of six, uh, you're probably going to hit that uh, octahedral sort of arrangement. So uh, once again, these guys kind of go with certain coordination numbers here. which obviously would be our SP, SP3, SP3D, and SP3D2 hybridization. So let us talk about sort of the electrons that we find uh, in the metal. And what we're looking at are really in these complex ions most of the time are transition metals. Uh, so obviously transition metals, as we saw earlier in this chapter and talked about, uh, they do begin really at the 3D sort of orbitals, if you will. And there are five different D orbitals, and that is these guys right here. Here's our D, Z squared, X squared, Y squared, and so forth. They kind of look like two P orbitals put together and one with a P orbital and a donut right about there. Now, when there is really no ligands present, all of these d orbitals are pretty much the same energy. So if you kind of think about it, like when you do electron configuration, they're all like perfectly equal to each other there. But when we start adding some ligands in, <clears throat> we actually get some shifting that occurs within the atom and these d orbitals. So the transition metal by itself, all five of those d orbitals are perfectly sort of equal in terms of energy. When we start getting some ligands involved, we get what is referred to as sort of a splitting that occurs of these five D orbitals. We actually, in this case, get two that go up higher in energy and three that go lower in energy are your squares go up higher in energy and lower in energy is your X, Y, Y, Z, and Z, X. This is what is referred to the difference in energy between sort of the lower set of D orbitals and the higher set of D orbitals is what is known as crystal field splitting it is sometimes abbreviated with just like a little triangle, if you will. And that is the energy difference between them. This is important because it's going to affect how the electrons sort of populate uh, these orbitals. And what we're really looking at here is an octahedral arrangement with a coordination number of six is this particular guy that we're looking at. So for example, if we look at, let's look at, let's look at cobalt, which is 27. And if we wrote the electron configuration for cobalt, it would be argon 4s2, 3d7 right <clears throat> so let's say that we ended up with a cobalt uh, that had a plus two charge right if a cobalt had a plus two charge that would leave me how many electrons left which ones would be lost first yeah so remember the transition metals will always lose the s electrons first that would leave me 3d7 those seven electrons would be distributed through here, right? One at a time, that's four, that's five, that's six, and that's seven. Now, in the presence of a ligand, these seven electrons are now going to be distributed to the right. And what's going to happen is they will populate that the same way as it did just a second ago. We will go here, we will go here, we will go here, and that's three of my seven that I want to kind of display here. Now, 
the deal is if this splitting here is really large, let's just say in this first case, what's going to happen is that fourth electron is gonna go, that's like way too up there. I don't feel like going up there. And what's gonna end up happening is he's gonna decide, I'm gonna just start pairing back up down here until I'm pretty much forced to go up here because there's really no other way for me to go but to end up there. So instead of sort of all the orbitals there sort of picking up electrons, right? Because of the splitting that occurred, uh, we actually end up getting a lot more paired electrons in this case, right? As opposed to unpaired electrons. Any questions on that there? Now, let's just say that we do the same thing and we take our seven electrons here and we're going to distribute them in a situation where the crystal field splitting is not very big. So maybe it's a small splitting that occurs. So as these electrons go in, they will go one, they will go two, they will go three. And at this point I'll go, it's not that far up there. So we will populate like normal four, five, and then come back down six and seven in this case. Now, because of that splitting of those D orbitals was not so large, the electrons sort of populated like it normally would. And we actually end up with a lot more unpaired electrons. So when we talk about sort of bonding in these guys, a lot of what we look at, a lot of times the questions are asked like how many unpaired electrons would you have or how many, um, is this thing paramagnetic? Paramagnetic ray means that you have some unpaired electrons happening. So this definitely would qualify for that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so where does sort of the energy come from? Uh, they're very close in energy. So it doesn't take a lot of energy to sort of populate up an electron and we can calculate, oops, Back. There we, go. we can actually calculate the energy of the crystal field splitting by using an equation you probably are familiar with. That is E is equal to H times the frequency. H is our Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. That is a constant. And the new there is our frequency, right? Might also remember C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, right? Speed being speed being C being the speed of light, which is our three times eight meters per second. This is obviously our wavelength, right? In meters, and that is our frequency, which is typically in one over seconds or reciprocal seconds. One over seconds is also known as a Hertz, right? So that's the same thing. So putting those equations together, if you only know the wavelength, you could do E equals HC divided by the wavelength and you can figure out the energy. So we could use this equation to figure out the energy split uh, between different orbitals. If we know the wavelength of light that's coming in or out of this particular situation, uh, this is something that we do that we've done in lab, right? which is we typically want to select the maximum absorbance value, right? And the purpose of that is all of our readings should be readable. If we chose again, a wavelength way over here, we're going to have a lot of values that obviously will not sort of register. They'll be off the scale. So I think it's filled in for you. So we'll just talk about the calculation here. So if the absorption maximum for a complex ion occurs at 470 nanometers, what color of the complex, what is the color of the complex and what is the crystal field splitting? So first off, right, the color that we see in solutions is actually the complementary color, right? To the color of light that's being absorbed. Uh, so that's why when we have a red solution, we don't set it to the web, the red, red wavelength. Uh, you know, we set it to like in the greenish sort of wavelength, which is the complementary color. That is our color wheel right here. 
So in this particular case, it absorbs light in the 470th region, um, which means it absorbs this blue light. So to us, this complex will look the complementary color to blue, which would be orange in this particular case. Uh, again, that's why I mentioned earlier, you know, when we did maybe the equilibrium experiment with the red guy, you know, you were setting your wavelength in this area, probably the 490-ish type range because it's complementary to the color we saw uh, in that particular case. Now to calculate the crystal field splitting, in this case, we have obviously only the wavelength giving given to us. So we would use basically this equation here. Uh, the top two guys are constants. So that is Planck's constant right there. That is the speed of light. And this is our conversion to make sure units cancel out, right? To convert nanometers to meters uh, in this particular case. So uh, <clears throat> one nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters, right? Uh, so that is what that conversion looks like. Gives us that the crystal field splitting is 4.23 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And if we wanted to know basically how many kilojoules per mole that would be, this number here that we just got is technically joules per atom. So atom means Avogadro's numbers should be involved. So 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole. Atoms cancel, leaves you joules per mole. And then obviously convert joules to kilojoules here at the back end there, that conversion, 1,000 joules in a kilojoule, right? Would be the next thing to do. Do all that good stuff, we get a crystal field splitting of about 255 kilojoules per mole. Any question on that calculation there? <clears throat> So if I had a uh, complex ion that absorbed in the like 570th, 570 nanometer range, uh, it would appear what color to us? The 570 nanometer would be here, which means it should look purple to us. Yeah, so that would be what we're looking at. We also know uh, waves and energy, right? So longer wavelength, uh, lower energy, right? Shorter wavelength, higher frequency, higher energy. Uh, red is uh, less energetic, if you will, than purple or violet. So let's talk a little bit about this. How do we know if that splitting is going to be large or it's going to be relatively small? And we can use what is known as a spectrochemical series, which is what we see here. Depending on really the ligands that are involved there, um, you may get some different splitting that will occur. If you have something like iodine, bromide, chloride, or hydroxide in this sort of region, uh, that is what is referred to as a weak field. Weak field means that the splitting is relatively small between the different d orbitals. On the other side, we have what is sometimes referred to as a strong field. And a strong field will result in a larger splitting that will occur um, in the middle. Well, in the middle is the middle. So it can kind of go either way sometimes. So a lot of times they will tell you, hey, do this for strong field or do this for weak field um, or do this for high spin or low spin is another sort of terminology that we talk about. So a second ago, I distributed sort of the seven electrons. And one time I distributed it like this. And what we see here is we have basically one unpaired electron when I distribute it like that. That would be what is considered low spin. Yeah? And low spin is a result of ending up with not a lot of unpaired electrons. And that's usually a result that occurs when you have a strong field situation because the strong field situation is going to have a big difference in the energy of those orbitals. And it's gonna allow them to actually pair up first before they journey upwards uh, to the higher energy level. And that's different than the second time around there when I went through there and I distributed the electrons. Um, when I distributed the second time in a sort of a weak field situation, what we ended up was everybody sort of filling in like normal. 
and we end up with one, two, three sort of unpaired electrons, a lot more unpaired electrons. And that is what is sometimes referred to as a high spin situation. Again, usually occurring in a weak field uh, because those electrons will really populate uh, the orbitals following Hund's rule, uh, basically like it normally would. Now, like I said, in the middle or even in if it's not in the middle, they sometimes will give you some direction in terms of how to do it. And in some cases, they may not give you direction because it will not make a difference. Uh, so maybe you only end up with three electrons, which means no matter what, uh, they're never getting out of the bottom there, right? Because there's high spin, low spin. There's not enough electrons to populate anybody above there. So. Uh, sometimes it, when you do it, it will not make a difference. And that might be a situation where you might not give any instructions. Uh, but again, in the middle, they'll sometimes give you instructions as to, again, do a weak field or high spin or low spin and strong field. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at one here uh, together and then we'll kind of see it. So let's say we're going to do the top guy here. So we'll look at this first one here. All right, so the first thing we might want to figure out is what is the charge here on our nickel? Uh, we obviously have a BR, which is minus one, and there's six of them is minus six. That means my nickel here should be carrying a plus four charge. Coordination number here would be six so it is going to do that octahedral splitting that we've just been talking about because of that now if we look at nickel with no charge uh, that is 28 there on the periodic table obviously then our configuration would be argon 4s2 3d8 now, in this case, my nickel has a plus four charge, which means it has only 24 electrons. It should lose the first two out of the S. We also then should take two out of that guy, which actually would leave us six if I took two out, so we would be left with six. So this nickel with a plus four charge pretty much has six D electrons that need to be distributed among those D orbitals. Once again, it's going to follow this splitting here. So we're gonna get three in the lower energy level and we're going to get two in the higher energy level there. So we will end up with our splitting that looks something like this. Um, and again, what we wanna look at now is the ligand here is BR. So if we come back to our chart here, we see BR over here, and that is definitely towards the weak field splitting, which tells us that the splitting here should be weak field, which means it's going to be small. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> All right, so at this point, if we wanted to, uh, distribute our electrons. We have six of them to distribute. We're going to do it like normal, one, two, three. At this point, because that splitting is relatively small, they will continue to populate like normal. So that is five. Coming back down now here is six. Any questions on that there? your x, y, your y, z, z squared, x squared, y squared. I want to get fancy and do that right. And x, z. <clears throat> uh, y, x squared, y squared, z squared. Now, a couple of questions we can answer now. First off, is this... Is this high spin or low spin? This is uh, definitely high spin here. Here we got basically four unpaired electrons, which would be typically the other question that you're asked, which is four unpaired electrons. Any questions on that there? 
All right, then why don't you try the next three there that we got, see what you come up with. Why don't you draw the crystal field splitting? And determine how many unpaired electrons. And is it high? Are low spin. So nickel is obviously up there, and iron is 26 on the periodic table there. All right, take a few minutes, see what you come up with on those there. Nickel one next, which is this guy here. Uh, so once again, ethyl endodiamine is neutral, which means in this case, the nickel will once again have our plus four charge. And since we did our electron configuration on the last one, we see that it basically will have the same six D electrons that we need to distribute. But the ligand here is different. So it is EEN, which is over here towards sort of the strong field size. So we'll do it for that. So we'll do this as strong field. And in this case, uh, we once again, will get our splitting that occurs. And uh, we will go with this as now strong field. That means this is gonna be relatively large. So our first electron would go there, our second would go there, our third would go there, and then decide, no, thank you, we'll go this way, right? And we basically will pair off in this case. This is going to result in no unpaired electrons, right? And that's diamagnetic, and that means that this is definitely going to be a low spin situation that occurs here. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Once again, the coordination number here is what? Coordination number is, it is six since that's the splitting I just did. And it is because ethyl-endyldiamine is bidentate, which means every one of those gives you two connections. So two times three is six that happens in this case. Any question on that one there? All right, let's take a look at the, our iron guys we got going on. So our iron one is, we'll do the FEF6 here. FEF6 and a minus three. So uh, fluoride, there's minus one and there's six of them, which is a minus six. That's going to give us an iron with a plus three charge. Coordination number here is going to be six as well, since that's monodente. Uh, iron is 26 with no charge. So that is an argon, 4s2, and a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3d6. An iron with a plus three charge would take out the s electrons and also take out one of those guys there, leaving you for the purposes of what we're doing here, basically 5D electrons to distribute. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> we then wanna kind of take a peek over here at fluorine, which is, eh, it's kind of hanging out right there-ish. We'll go weak on this one and see. So if we do this for weak field here, we would end up with, Uh, one, two, three, and then it will decide that's okay. That's not too bad, right? That's relatively small. And that would definitely give us five unpaired electrons in this case, which definitely would be high spin. Yeah. Any questions on that one there? Now, would it make a difference if they said to do it as strong field? And it would in this case, obviously, if they decided for whatever reason to tell you to do this particular one, since it's kind of edging towards the middle there and told you to do this as strong field, when we would distribute, we would go this way and then decide that is too high in energy. We will come back this way 
this results in now only one unpaired electron, a little bit more of a low spin complex. So again, sometimes some of those in the middle, they may tell you one way or the other. If not, you know, you could hedge it whichever way you want to go. Uh, it's closer to you. So if we did obviously weak field, we would end up with this situation and strong field end up there. <clears throat> Any question on that there? And our other iron one there was FECN6. So that is FECN6, also at minus three, I think. Uh, so once again, this is minus one for the cyanide. Minus six, giving us our plus three. One more time there for our iron. And that gave us five electrons to distribute. Here at CN, that definitely looks strong field there since it's sitting right on the arrow. So we definitely will do strong field here for that. And if we do strong field, this is pretty much what I just drew on the other side there, but we will get our octahedral splitting. Again, because the coordination number here is six in this case. And that would get us our one, two, three. Once again, this is going to be strong field, uh, which means it's going to be really large, that energy difference. So we are going to get that pairing up there, resulting in one unpaired electron. And definitely would be a low spin uh, situation in this case. <clears throat> Any question on how to draw, how to figure out unpaired electrons, high spin, low spin, any of those questions? So again, I think sometimes people get uh, messed up on is, again, we're looking at the transition metal and how many electrons it needs to distribute with its current oxidation state. All right. Which I think is what we just did there. So it's good they agree. There are all sort of the different arrangements you could have in a low spin, high spin situation, depending on how many electrons you're distributing. Again, on the left hand side, uh, we have a much uh, weaker field happening here. And what you see, if you look through most of them, there's a lot more unpaired electrons happening there on the left. Over here, these guys would be more strong field resulting in those electrons wanting to pair up first before they go up uh, and result in obviously a lot less unpaired electrons, a lot more low spin situation. Again, paired electrons basically cancel each other out, right? Because one has the guy going up, right? Has in terms of his spin quantum number plus a half, yeah. Guy going down has in terms of his spin quantum number minus a half, right? So they sort of balance each other out when they are paired up there. <laughs> the same orbital. Now, when we do get to a different coordination number, we do get some different geometry. So this again is a coordination number of four, and this will result in a tetrahedral arrangement. And what we get is the same type of splitting, except that it's sort of upside down than the octahedral splitting. So we get all of our squared guys on the bottom and our sort of individual guys, X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z up on top. Works the same way here. If you had to do one of these for tetrahedral, you would figure out obviously how many electrons there are in that uh, transition metal, and it would be distributed the same way. If it was weak field, then it would just jump up there and fill these guys in like normal one at a time, and then obviously coming back and pairing off. And obviously if it was strong field, when you get done with the bottom two, they would then pair off at that point and then come back up here and start basically filling in like normal as you go to the top. Uh, so it works kind of the same way, just sort of flipped in terms of energy, how the D orbitals are. You could also have everybody's favorite, which is square planar, also with a coordination number of four. And you get some crazy splitting going on over here in this type of thing. Um, and again, uh, you know, obviously they would populate the lowest energy level there first. Any questions on any of that there? For us, you are responsible for tetrahedral and this splitting, and then obviously the octahedral coordination number six. 
we will leave the crazy square planar out for us. So, um, so there's basically just opposites of each other. So responsible for octahedral splitting and tetrahedral splitting and being able to obviously draw these things to figure out how many unpaired electrons, high spin, low spin, any questions on any of that there? Okay, that should wrap up this chapter, believe it or not. We're down to two chapters to go. We're going to skip ahead. We're going to go to nuclear chemistry, and we're going to save organic for, you know, next time. So obviously, nuclear chemistry involves uh, radioactivity. <clears throat> and when we talk about something being radioactive, um, sometimes referred to as a nuclei, uh, and that is a spontaneously decomposition to a smaller nucleus. This happens through radioactive decay. Um, it's unstable. A major difference between, say, nuclear reactions and nuclear chemistry and just uh, chemistry, I guess, or chemical reactions, non-nuclear, is nuclear reactions deal with basically what is in the nucleus, right? And what's in the nucleus is our protons and our neutrons. And they're sometimes referred to as nucleons when they talk about that. So you'll see this word kind of used a lot here in this chapter, which is a nucleon, which is basically your guys that are in your nucleus, which is your protons, right? And your neutrons. Protons have what type of charge? Positive one, right? Neutrons, no charge. Electrons have negative one charge. And that's different than in a chemical reaction. In a chemical reaction, it's all about electrons, right? It's all about the electrons breaking bonds, making bonds. And that's why, as we will see very shortly here, when we balance a chemical reaction, a sort of normal chemical reaction, uh, we have conservation of the elements. You know, we start with four carbons, we end with four carbons. They may be rearranged and put in different things. As we will see in nuclear reactions, there are no conservation of the elements. What you start with and what you end with end up being different elements because electrons are really not involved, protons and neutrons are involved. Which one of those two are the most important in terms of determining what element you are talking about? Proton or the neutron? It is the proton are known as the atomic number, right? Which we find on the periodic table. Uh, it is the one that determines basically what element you're talking about. So part of radioactive decay and going through radioactive decay is, you know, perhaps we take a proton and convert it to a neutron. A neutron converts into a proton. We make more protons and get rid of some protons. So we get a lot of elements that obviously change from one spot to the next as they're going through this process. Uh, the decomposition of this does involve emitting, uh, this nuclei emitting some type of particle and our energy that occurs. Uh, so sometimes neutrons, for example, are given off, and sometimes other particles, radioactive particles are given off, like alpha particles, beta, and, and so forth are given off in the process. Where we start with, or what we start with, is sometimes referred to as the parent nuclei, and as the nucleus undergoes this radioactive decay, uh, we end up with the daughter, and that's usually the, the one that's formed as a result of nuclear decay or radioactive decay. Anybody about 84 or more protons are usually radioactive. That's like definitely your bottom row there on the periodic table where uranium and all those guys are hanging out. So let's talk a little bit about some different types of particles and stuff that we do come across a lot in uh, nuclear chemistry. Our good friend Rutherford, he did what did Rutherford do? He liked gold foil type things, yes. He shot alpha particles at gold foil, right? Discovered sort of the actual structure of uh, the atom. Uh, but we have alpha particles. Alpha particles have a charge of plus two and a mass of four. It's really the helium nucleus. So in, in nuclear chemistry, an alpha particle is sometimes uh, abbreviated two ways, just simply using the alpha symbol with a four and a two. Our uh, helium is used a lot to represent a alpha particle in nuclear chemistry. So uh, that is also sometimes representative. A beta particle is something that has a minus one and negligible mass, and it's an electron. So the beta particle there uh, is sometimes used, or actually an electron's RNE, so our symbol is used for it. 
as well. Gamma rays, that is just like pure energy, it's just sometimes used like that. If you remember, you can find gamma on the electromagnetic spectrum to the left of X-rays, right? Again, talking earlier about waves, very short wavelength, very high energy, right? And a very strong emitter. Uh, in addition, there are some other particles that pop up sometimes. We use uh, our C positrons, which is like a, an electron with a better attitude. It's more positive. So it's like a positive, thank you for not laughing. It is a positive electron. Uh, sometimes confused is they actually will use the same symbols, a beta R an electron sort of symbol, but definitely the positive aspect of it will be denoted uh, in there. Um, sometimes a, a nuclear will undergo an electron capture. That means basically it gets hit with an electron uh, on it. When we talk about sort of these terminologies, um, there are some uh, terminologies that we come across that helps you decide where things should be. So if we think about an equation here with an arrow, if it is something that is emitted or goes through this type of decay, those particles will usually end up on the product side. So anything emitted going through this type of decay, you would put that uh, guy on the product side. Anything that is sort of electron captured or bombarded, those particles end up on the reactant side in the equation. So those are sort of where those guys would end up. <clears throat> That brings us to ways that we look at things, right? And this is the way isotopes are usually written. Top left is our mass number, which is our number of protons and neutrons. And on the bottom is our atomic number, which is the number of protons. Uh, you can find the atomic number, obviously, on the periodic table, as we just talked about. And once again, if you look at it, no number repeats, which means every single element has its own atomic number, which is usually a good place to start in nuclear chemistry to figure out what element is formed. Uh, you obviously could take your uh, mass number minus your atomic number, and you can get the number of new from that by subtracting mass number from atomic number, the top guy from bottom guy. Every element has protons, electrons, and neutrons, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen has on an electron, no neutron, but everybody else has all three particles. Can you find the mass number on the periodic table? You cannot. It is not the number that's on the bottom. The number's on the bottom, which is the atomic mass, this is different than mass number. When you get the mass number, atomic number, protons, electrons, or neutrons, they all should be positive whole numbers. It's a good way to remember that. Definitely none of the, most of the numbers on the bottom there are not whole numbers. So let's take a look at some of the other sort of symbols and stuff that we very commonly see here in nuclear chemistry. A proton is oftentimes seen. And again, there's a couple of different symbols that are used for a proton. Obviously, P for proton, H for a proton, which is a hydrogen. It has a mass number of one and atomic number of one. A neutron is seen a lot, has a mass number of one, atomic number of zero. This is uh, most commonly called a beta particle rather than an electron, but the beta particle here, as I showed you a second ago, uses both symbols. But again, it is minus one on the bottom there, zero up on top. And there's our positron, which once again uses the exact same symbols but you definitely see the plus one on both sides there. Um, I would say in terms of those two, because they really do use sort of the same symbols, probably nine times out of 10, if you're looking at something and it just shows a beta, it's probably the beta particle with a negative one. Um, again, if this wants to be the positive guy, definitely will put the positive there, or like we have on the bottom there, it will put the positive there, positive one. But you just have a lonely beta particle in something and doesn't really specify, it's probably pretty safe to assume it's the negative version of it. Usually, again, they definitely would distinguish the positron from it. Um, and in most cases, you'll have that bottom number. Alpha particles, again, helium are the alpha particle, the four and the two that is used. 
these are really important to understand uh, the particles and sort of the numbers that go with them because uh, it will help you figure out a lot of things when you're doing some nuclear equations. So make sure you get a good handle on that. Uh, obviously, different radioactive decay will emit uh, different types of particles. And depending, obviously, on the type of emitter it is, it may penetrate a lot further in lead or U as well. Uh, so as you can see, alpha, not too bad. It only goes about 0 0.01 millimeters in. Uh, beta penetrates a lot further at one millimeter and gamma keeps on going there as well. So if you ever find yourself working with radioactive material, you should always figure out what type of emitter it is to make sure that you are using the proper safety equipment. Sometimes you just need glove and a coat. Other times you need like a lot of lead and concrete between you and, and those type of things. So always a good idea to make sure you understand what you are dealing with. Uh, again, here are some of the other symbols and sort of our error symbols, if you will, where no numbers, but just kind of pluses and minuses are used over here. So let's talk about balancing nuclear equations, which is like super hard. Not really. All right. If you know how to add and you have a periodic table, you should be in good shape. So that's two things that you need. So because there really is uh, no conservation of the elements, as we talked about, because in nuclear chemistry, we're changing what's inside the nucleus. Uh, basically, the way we balance nuclear equations is when we add up all the mass numbers on the left-hand side, they frankly need to equal all the mass numbers that we have on the right-hand side there. So if we look on the top there, we obviously have a 236 happening up on top. Right-hand side, we got a 138, a 96 NA2, which I'm hoping is 236 as well. And then the other thing that we need is to basically add up all the atomic numbers on the left, we need to match all the atomic numbers on the, on the right. On the bottom there, we have 92, 55, 37, and zero give us 92. By the way, if we do have a coefficient, you do need to multiply that in to both of those numbers. And obviously that's how I got the extra two up there on top. Now, how would you a problem like this look? It may look just like this, but maybe something is missing. Let's just say this guy is missing. So if we look at this equation here with that guy missing, what we would do is add up our atomic number, which would be 92 on the left. We have a 55 and zero, which means 55 on the right-hand side. If we subtract those two there, that should give us a 37 as our missing atomic number. We would then go to the periodic table and find lucky number 37, which as we can see there is RB. We would then do the same thing for the top on the top. Top left, we have 236. Without the guy in the box there, we have 138 plus two, which is a buck 40. So we would take 236 minus 140, and that would leave us a 96 that's left over. So you do want to probably approach it by finding the atomic number first and go to the periodic table. That will allow you to find what's missing. Not all the time will it be an element. It probably will most of the time, but it could be a particle that's missing in a situation like this. So, you know, keep that in mind if you're like, I don't really see it, but are the, are the atomic number zero? Maybe it's like a neutron or something like that that may be missing. Any questions on that there? So let's take a look at uh, one like this. Let's say we have PO212. Uh, uh, decays by alpha emission. We want to write the balanced nuclear equation for this. So the first thing we would do, obviously, is start with our 212PO. We are missing the atomic number, so we could go to the periodic table and we find PO at 84, it looks like. Now it is going to decay through alpha emission. So alpha emission means emission or emitted. That particle ends up on the product side. So we would write our alpha particle, which is a four, two. Again, you can use the alpha symbol, or if you like, you can use the four, two and helium is perfectly fine as well, whichever way you wanna do that. And then pretty much, you know, that is what we're going to be looking for. 
Now we will look on the left-hand side there and attack the atomic number, which obviously on this side, we have 84. On the right-hand side, we have two, which means if we simply subtract those two, that leaves us an 82 that's left over for our atomic number. And our 82 atomic number there is from the periodic table lead. And we would do the same thing for our mass number. So up on top here, we have a 212. And on the right-hand side there, we obviously have four. So if we subtract those two, uh, looks like a 208 is what we will end up with. That means that our balanced equation would look something like this. Once again, uh, 82 and two on the bottom here is 84, which matches this guy, so that's good. Up on top, four and 208 is 212, which matches this guy here. So again, mass number and atomic numbers, balance on each side. Any questions on that there? All right, well. Sounds good.